Part One of the Red-Headed League. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Red-Headed League by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Part One. I had called upon my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, one day in the autumn of last year, and found him in deep conversation with a very stout, florid-faced elderly gentleman with fiery red hair. With an apology for my intrusion, I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. "'You could not possibly have come at a better time, my dear Watson,' he said cordially. "'I was afraid that you were engaged. So I am very much so.' then i can wait in the next room not at all this gentleman mr wilson has been my partner and helper in many of my most successful cases and i have no doubt that he will be of the utmost use to me in yours also the stout gentleman half rose from his chair and gave a bob of greeting with a quick little questioning glance from his small fat encircled eyes try the settee said Holmes, relapsing into his armchair, and putting his fingertips together, as was his custom when in judicial moods. I know, my dear Watson, that you share my love of all that is bizarre and outside the conventions and humdrum routine of everyday life. You have shown your relish for it by the enthusiasm which has prompted you to chronicle, and, if you will excuse my saying so, somewhat to embellish so many of my own little adventures your cases have indeed been of greatest interest to me i observed you will remember that i remarked the other day just before we went into the very simple problem presented by miss mary sutherland that for strange effects and extraordinary combinations we must go to life itself which is always far more daring than any effort of the imagination. A proposition which I took the liberty of doubting? You did, doctor, but nonetheless you must come round to my view, for otherwise I shall keep on piling fact upon fact on you until your reason breaks down under them and acknowledges me to be right. Now, Mr. Jabez Wilson here, has been good enough to call upon me this morning, and to bring a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular which I have listened to for some time. You have heard me remark that the strangest and most unique things are very often connected not with the larger, but with the smaller crimes, and occasionally, indeed, where there is room for doubt whether any positive crime has been committed. As far as I have heard, it is impossible for me to say whether the present case is an instance of crime or not, but the course of events is certainly among the most singular that I have ever listened to. Perhaps, Mr. Wilson, you would have the great kindness to recommence your narrative. I ask you not merely because my friend, Dr. Watson, has not heard the opening part, but also because the peculiar nature of the story makes me anxious to have every possible detail from your lips. As a rule, when I have heard some slight indication of the course of events, I am able to guide myself by the thousands of other similar cases which occur to my memory. In the present instance, I am forced to admit that the facts are, to the best of my belief, unique. The portly client puffed out his chest with an appearance of some little pride, and pulled a dirty and wrinkled newspaper from the inside pocket of his greatcoat. As he glanced down the advertisement column, with his head thrust forward and the paper flattened out upon his knee, I took a good look at the man, and endeavored, after the fashion of my companion, to read the indications which might be presented by his dress or appearance. I did not gain very much, however, by my inspection. Our visitor bore every mark of being an average, commonplace British tradesman, obese, pompous, and slow. 
He wore rather baggy gray shepherd's check trousers, a not over-clean black frock coat, unbuttoned in the front, and a drab waistcoat with a heavy brassy Albert chain, and a square pierced bit of metal dangling down as an ornament, a frayed top hat, and a faded brown overcoat with a wrinkled velvet collar lay upon a chair beside him. Altogether, look as I would, there was nothing remarkable about the man save his blazing red head and the expression of extreme chagrin and discontent upon his features. Sherlock Holmes's quick eye took in my occupation, and he shook his head with a smile as he noticed my questioning glances. Beyond the obvious facts that he has at some time done manual labor, that he takes snuff, that he is a Freemason, that he has been to China, and that he has done a considerable amount of writing lately, I can deduce nothing else. Mr. Jabez Wilson started up in his chair, with his forefinger upon the paper, put his eyes upon my companion. "'How in the name of good fortune did you know all that, Mr. Holmes?' he asked. "'How did you know, for example, that I did manual labor? It's true as gospel, for I began as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir, your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. You have worked with it, and the muscles are more developed. Well, the snuff, then, and the Freemasonry. I won't insult your intelligence by telling you how I read that, especially as, rather against the strict rules of your order, you use an arc and compass breast pen. Ah, of course, I forgot that. But the writing? What else can be indicated by that right cuff so very shiny for five inches, and the left one with the smooth patch near the elbow where you rested upon the desk? Well, but China? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. I have made a small study of tattoo marks, and have even contributed to the literature of the subject. The trick of staining the fish's scales of a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China, when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch-chain, the matter becomes even more simple. Mr. Jabez Wilson laughed heavily. Well, I never, said he. I thought at first that you had done something clever, but I see that there was nothing in it after all. I begin to think, Watson, said Holmes, that I make a mistake in explaining. Omne ignotum pro magnifico, you know, and my poor little reputation, such as it is, will suffer shipwreck if I am so candid. Can you not find the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Uh, yes, I have got it now, he answered, with his thick red finger planted halfway down the column. Here it is. Uh, this is what began it all. You just read it for yourself, sir. I took the paper from him and read as follows. To the Red-Headed League, on account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, U.S.A., there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men who are sound in body and mind and above the age of twenty-one years are eligible. Apply in person on Monday at eleven o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street. What on earth does this mean? I ejaculated after I had twice read over the extraordinary announcement. Holmes chuckled and wriggled in his chair, as was his habit when in high spirits. <laughs> it is a little off the beaten track, isn't it? said he. And now, Mr. Wilson, off you go at scratch, and tell us all about yourself, your household, and the effect which this advertisement had upon your fortunes. You will first make a note, doctor, of the paper and the date. Hmm, it is the Morning Chronicle of April 27, 1890, just two months ago. Very good. Now, Mr. Wilson? Well, it is just as I have been telling you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. 
said Jabez Wilson, mopping his forehead. I have a small pawnbroker's business at Coburg Square, uh, near the city. It is not a very large affair, and of late years it has not done more than just give me a living. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only keep one, and I would have a job to pay him, but that he is willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. What is the name of this obliging youth? asked Sherlock Holmes. His name is Vincent Spaulding, and he's not such a youth, either. It's hard to say his age. I should not wish a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes, and I know very well that he could better himself and earn twice what I am able to give him. But after all, if he is satisfied, why should I put ideas in his head? Why, indeed? You seem most fortunate in having an employee who comes under the full market price. It is not a common experience among employers in this age. I don't know that your assistant is not as remarkable as your advertisement. Oh, he has his faults, too, said Mr. Wilson. Never was such a fellow for photography, snapping away with a camera when he ought to be improving his mind, and then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. That is his main fault. But on the whole, he's a good worker. There's no vice in him. He is still with you, I presume? Yes, sir. He and a girl of fourteen who does a bit of simple cooking and keeps the place clean. That's all I have in the house, for I am a widower and never had any family. We live very quietly, sir, the three of us, and we keep a roof over our heads and pay our debts if we do nothing more. The first thing that put us out was that advertisement. Spaulding, he came down into the office just this day, eight weeks, with this very paper in his hand, and he says, I wish to the Lord, Mr. Wilson, that I was a red-headed man. Why is that? I asks. Why? says he. Here's another vacancy on the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth quite a little fortune to any man who gets it. And I understand that there are more vacancies than there are men, so that the trustees are at their wits' end what to do with the money. If my hair would only change color, here's a nice little crib all ready for me to step into. Why, what is it, then? I asked. You see, Mr. Holmes, I am a very stay-at-home man, and as my business came to me instead of my having to go to it, I was often weeks on end without putting my foot over the doormat. In that way I don't know much of what was going on outside, and I was always glad of a bit of news. "'Have you never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men?' he asked with his eyes open. "'Never. Why, I wonder at that, for you are eligible yourself for one of the vacancies.' "'And what are they worth?' I asked. Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year, but the work is slight, and it need not interfere very much with one's other occupations. Well, you can easily think that that made me prick up my ears, for the business has not been over good for some years, and an extra couple of hundred would have been very handy. Tell me all about it, said I. Well, said he, showing me the advertisement, you can see for yourself that the League has a vacancy, and there is the address where you should apply for particulars. As far as I can make out, the League was founded by an American millionaire, Ezekiah Hopkins, who was very peculiar in his ways. He himself was red-headed, and he had a great sympathy for all red-headed men, so when he died it was found that he had left his enormous fortune in the hands of trustees with instructions to apply the interest to the providing of easy births to men whose hair is of that color. From all I hear, it is splendid pay and very little to do. But, said I, there would be millions of red-headed men who would apply. Not so many as you might think, he answered. You see, it is really confined to Londoners and to grown men. This American had started from London when he was young, and he wanted to do the old town a good turn, 
Then again, I have heard it is of no use your applying if your hair is light red or dark red, or anything but real bright blazing fiery red. Now, if you care to apply, Mr. Wilson, you would just walk in. But perhaps it would hardly be worth your while to put yourself out of the way for the sake of a few hundred pounds. Now, it is a fact, gentlemen, as you may see for yourselves, that my hair is of a very full and rich tint, so that it seemed to me that if there was to be any competition in the matter, I stood as good a chance as any man that I had ever met. Vincent Spaulding seemed to know so much about it that I thought he might prove useful, so I ordered him to put up the shutters for the day and to come right away with me. He was very willing to have a holiday, so we shut the business up and started off for the address that was given us in the advertisement. I never hope to see such a sight as that again, Mr. Holmes. From north, south, east, and west, every man who had a shade of red in his hair had tramped into the city to answer the advertisement. Fleet Street was choked with red-headed folk, and Pope's Court looked like a coaster's orange barrow. I should not have thought there were so many in the whole country as were brought together by that single advertisement. Every shade of color they were—straw, lemon, orange, brick, iris, setter, liver, clay—but, as Spaulding said, there were not many who had the real vivid flame-colored tint. When I saw how many were waiting, I would have given it up in despair, but Spaulding would not hear of it. How he did it I could not imagine, but he pushed and pulled and butted until he got me through the crowd, and right up to the steps which led to the office. There was a double stream upon the stair, some going up in hope and some coming back dejected, but we wedged in as well as we could and found ourselves in the office. Your experience has been a most entertaining one remarked Holmes, as his client paused and refreshed his memory with a huge pinch of snuff. Pray continue your very interesting statement. There was nothing in the office but a couple of wooden chairs and a deal table, behind which sat a small man with a head that was even redder than mine. He said a few words to each candidate as he came up, and then he always managed to find some fault in them which would disqualify them. Getting a vacancy did not seem to be such a very easy matter, after all. However, when our turn came, the little man was much more favorable to me than to any of the others, and he closed the door as we entered, so that he might have a private word with us. "'This is Mr. Jabez Wilson,' said my assistant, "'and he is willing to fill a vacancy in the League.' "'And he is admirably suited for it,' the other answered. He has every requirement. I cannot recall when I have seen anything so fine. He took a step backward, cocked his head on one side, and gazed at my hair until I felt quite bashful. Then suddenly he plunged forward, wrung my hand, and congratulated me warmly on my success. It would be injustice to hesitate, said he. You will, however, I am sure, excuse me for taking an obvious precaution. With that, he seized my hair in both his hands and tugged until I yelled with the pain. There is water in your eyes, said he as he released me. I perceive that all is as it should be. But we have to be careful, for we have twice been deceived by wigs and once by paint. I could tell you tales of cobbler's wax which would disgust you with human nature. He stepped over to the window and shouted through it at the top of his voice that the vacancy was filled. A groan of disappointment came up from below, and the folk all trooped away in different directions until there was not a red head to be seen except my own and that of the manager. My name, said he, is Mr. Duncan Ross and I am myself one of the pensioners upon the fund left by our noble benefactor. Are you a married man, Mr. Wilson? Have you a family? I answered that I had not. His face fell immediately. Dear me, he said gravely, that is very serious indeed. 
I am sorry to hear you say that. The fun was, of course, for the propagation and spread of the redheads, as well as for their maintenance. It is exceedingly unfortunate that you should be a bachelor. My face lengthened at this, Mr. Holmes, for I thought that I was not to have the vacancy after all. But after thinking it over for a few minutes, he said that it would be all right. In the case of another, said he, the objection might be fatal. But we must stretch a point in favor of a man with such a head of hair as yours. When shall you be able to enter upon your new duties? Well, it is a little awkward, for I have a business already, said I. Oh, never mind about that, Mr. Wilson, said Vincent Spaulding. I should be able to look after that for you. What would be the hours? I asked. Ten to two. Now a pawnbroker's business is mostly done of an evening, Mr. Holmes, especially Thursday and Friday evenings, which is just before payday. So it would suit me very well to earn a little in the mornings. Besides, I knew that my assistant was a good man, and that he would see to anything that turned up. That would suit me very well, said I, and the pay is four pounds a week. And the work? is purely nominal. What do you call purely nominal? Well, you have to be in the office, or at least in the building, the whole time. If you leave, you forfeit your whole position forever. The will is very clear upon that point. You don't comply with the conditions if you budge from the office during that time. It's only four hours a day, and I should not think of leaving, said I. No excuse will avail, said Mr. Duncan Ross, neither sickness nor business nor anything else. There you must stay, or you lose your billet. And the work is to copy out the Encyclopedia Britannica. There is the first volume of it in that press. You must find your own ink, pens, and blotting paper, but we provide this table and chair. Will you be ready tomorrow? Certainly, I answered. Then good-bye, Mr. Jabez Wilson, and let me congratulate you once more on the important position which you have been fortunate enough to gain. He bowed me out of the room, and I went home with my assistant, hardly knowing what to say or do. I was so pleased at my own good fortune. End of Part One